person is not in law the physical man. So now you know why they created the entity using all capital letters within birth certificates issued by the state. They convert the common lawful man to a person of a fictional legal entity subject to administration by state rules, orders, and codes. All right, because there's in there's no law within any rule or code. It's not a law. It's just a rule. Of course, rules and codes don't apply to the lawful man of the Lord, if you want to say. Mm-hmm. Um, but he must be converted to a legal person of fictional status because they're a fiction to begin with, and fictions can only deal with other fictions. They can't deal with a man, a physical state Are that you, he's in. So you can't cross. There's no there's no interrelationship between the two. Right. That That's at least... Recognized, right? Okay. Nothing is recognized. <clears throat> so the Chantry courts are the crown courts, where the decisions of so-called justice are decided by three judges. Uh, it's a direct result of the crown temple having invoked the rule and code over all judicial courts. Every judicial court in this country is not anything to do with this country. It's done with the crown. It's held held by the crown. Here's a quote. It is held to be a settled rule that our courts cannot take notice of any title to land not derived from the state or colonial government and duly verified by patent. 4 Johns, Rep. 163, Jackson v. Walters, 12 Johns, Rep. 365, SP. So, the Crown Temple granted letters patent and charters for all the land and all the colonies in New England and the King of England a sworn member of the Middle Temple, as the Queen is now. Since the people were giving their patent charter corporations, the governors of the colonies had a hard time, especially concerning the Crown taxation. And the scheme was devised to allow the Americans to believe they were granted independence. Remember, the Crown Templars represented, presented both parties at the 1776 Declaration. And not only there, but to the Treaty of Peace. Every one of them was an esquire that signed it. So you got one party signing both sides, don't you? Uh Uh-huh. Is that legal? Uh, If they say it is. Yeah, they say it is, right. Yeah, that's that's under conquest. That's why they say it is. Right, they make the laws of it. Now, the reason they had that declaration was recognized by international treaty law in order to establish the new legal crown entity of the incorporated United States Middle Templar King George III agreed to in the Treaty of Paris. Quote, between the crown of Great Britain and said United States. Well, wait a minute. The crown of Great Britain is the same as the crown of the United States. So there's the agreement right there that is totally a total fraud. So, um, most important is the actual signatories of the Treaty of Paris. Like I said, they were all esquires. So, um, this legally signifies officers of the king's court, which are now known as Templar courts or crown courts. So this is the same crown Templar title given to Alexander Hamilton. So, the David Hartley, he was a middle Templar of the king's court representing the United States. John Adams, Ben Franklin, and John Jay. They were all the signatories for the United States and were also Middle Templars of the Crown's Court through the Bar Association. Plainly written in history proves again that Crown Temple was representing both parties to the agreement. Perfect and elaborate scam, huh? How are the American people ever going to know this? They don't. They, They... they don't go into research like we do and find out. They have no idea this is sitting in the background controlling them. Now, now you, you, when you mentioned Patrick Henry's um, opposition to such. Right. It, was, there, was there a sizable number of people involved in government in that day? Oh, yeah, there, yeah. There was, uh, uh, if, you, if you get stories, um, Anti-Federalist, it's called the Anti-Federalist, 
and it's edited by Herbert Storing. And it's a really good book. It's a complete anti-federalist book. And um, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Maryland, Virginia, and New York are all represented in here. It also gives the speeches of Patrick Henry in the Virginia State Ratifying Convention. That's 1788. And um, they have, uh, oh, numerous. Agrippa is one of them from Massachusetts. Uh, they wrote. Uh, another one was uh, the minority of the convention. They all called themselves different names at the time. Then there's the essays. Um, there is uh, the Pennsylvania. And what happened in, in one of the Pennsylvanians, and, and also the letters called the Federal Farmer, um, there was um, a big hullabaloo because they said uh, Pennsylvania couldn't get down to the convention and they already passed everything without them being there. So um, in the Pennsylvania, called the Minority Convention, it says, I'm quoting right out of Storing's, the Congress might gloss over this conduct by construing every purpose for which the state legislatures now lay taxes to be for the general welfare and therefore as of their jurisdiction. And the supremacy laws of the United States is established by Article 6. And it goes on and talks about it and says, As there are no articles of taxation reserved to the state governments, Congress may monopolize every source of revenue and thus indirectly demolish the state governments. Well, they've done that now. For without funds, they could not exist. The taxes, duties, and excises imposed by Congress may be so high as to render it impractical to levy further sums on the same articles. But whether this should be the case or not, if the state government should presume to impose taxes, duties on the same articles with Congress, the latter may abrogate and repeal the laws whereby they are imposed upon the allegation. Now, this is those people knew at the time, and they were coming in and saying all this happy stuff was going to happen, and it was not right. But the average American people, just like the average American people today, they could care less. They weren't involved. They, they didn't want to get involved. They just wanted to make their life and go on and get what they could and have all their worldly possessions that they had. And, you know, they weren't worried about how government men who was taking over um, <coughs> and, and ruling their lives, you know, to infinity. Now, this, this happened under uh, Jefferson's watch. Is that true? No, this was under Washington. Washington, okay. Yeah. But yeah, because this was October 12th, 1787. Okay, right. And Jefferson wouldn't come around until the turn of the century. Yeah. All right. And it said um, in, in, in their thing, he's saying, Dear Sir, and he goes in and says, It is to be observed that when the people shall adopt a proposed constitution, it will be their last and supreme act. It will be adopted not by the people of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, etc., but by the people of the United States. See? Right there, they're telling you that they knew that the people, the common man in the states, had nothing to do with the Constitution, creation, ratification, or whatever. And it was never ratified anyway. 